Welcome to the Systems View on Life, Developing Transdisciplinarity. My name is Geert Andringa. In this series, I am going to try to realize a number of pretty ambitious goals. One is to help you broaden your understanding. Another one is uh, to go crisscross through many domains of knowledge and help you understand all kinds of commonalities. Um, we are going to highlight all kinds of common themes in multiple domains and typically in the form of oppositions that you will see in many different places and quadrants that those are combinations of oppositions. I will introduce system theory and especially focus on the difference between open and closed systems that you see pretty much everywhere if you know where to look. And we will address the role of things like basic concepts like feeling, thinking, epistemological development, identity development and self-actualization. All things related to your own uh, thinking pro uh, processes and development. All in all, I'm going to illustrate this with societal examples. Typically every uh, session another one. And very importantly, I'm going to introduce a number of transdisciplinary key concepts. Uh, concepts that are so important that they uh, pervade pretty much every discipline. Uh, topics like life, agency, wisdom, intelligence, power. If you know how to look for them, you will see them everywhere. It is, makes sense maybe to uh, define what mono, multi, inter and especially transdisciplinarity actually is. In a mono discipline, people typically only talk to themselves, to their colleagues, and they are to some extent oblivious of their uh, role in a wider context. Uh, they they uh, really talk among themselves, uh, develop their domain among themselves. In multidisciplinarity, we have experts that uh, contribute to a larger whole, like a hospital, and they typically have a great respect for each other's contributions. So one expert will not really question the knowledge of another expert. That is part of the whole multidisciplinarity teamwork. But it also entails that the domains don't really learn so much from each other. And that is something that is improved in interdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinarity that is typically for smaller innovative teams or businesses that co-construct knowledge and results by bringing all kinds of disciplines together. And they allow each other to influence. Uh, each other. And then the next step is transdisciplinarity. Transdisciplinarity is rare, it is much more difficult and it depends on individuals who can transcend their own disciplinary boundaries and allow other people to come in their domain. So now we have disciplines that drive the developments of each other's conceptual framework and hence they are merging. Uh, they, they, they in the end result, uh, we have a uh, much more unity between the different domains. My uh, scientific background has been very important in coming up with this course. Um, so I started as uh, in physics, followed state physics. Then I was asked to help with the start of a cognitive science program that merged or that developed more into artificial intelligence later. And for my PhD work, I uh, worked in auditory biophysics and that led to a company called Sound Intelligence that I left after a while. Uh, and I uh, started my research group on auditory cognition. And that developed into an interest in both soundscapes and in what it actually means to have an educated mind and how to educate minds. And the educated mind thing uh, developed in my uh, work to, uh, at the University College Groningen, from the University of Groningen. And the soundscape work uh, eventually developed in the company Sound Appraisal. Um, as a sideline, I also have a uh, a great interest in, in the Earth as the biggest uh, environment of humanity in geopolitics and weirdly enough that also led to an organic farm. So I combine physics, psychology, uh, knowledge about the Earth as, a, as the biggest system uh, of humans and also of the economy of companies. And 
among all these different activities, I always was struck by how important life, the defining properties of life actually are, and, and agency as uh, the ability for a living entity to select its own behavior. I'm a soundscape researcher, and a soundscape uh, that is an acoustic environment as perceived or experienced and or understood by a person or people in context. So it is an acoustic environment, but not the physical thing. It is the perceived uh, acoustic environment or experienced acoustic environment. And uh, not only from a personal perspective, but also from a group perspective. And that in a context. So this is already pretty broad, uh, but if you generalize this, you get something like this. The world uh, as perceived or experienced and or understood by an agent or group of agents in context. So it's now no longer only the acoustic environment but the world as a whole and it's not only humans or people uh, but it is agents and an agent is just something that acts and uh, that through its own acts remains alive. So actually the proper word would be living agents agents for short. And this is the scope of the course. The world is perceived or experienced and or understood by an agent or group of agents in context. And that covers pretty much everything. So key issues are the living agent or the agent. Uh, questions like how do uh, agents give meaning to the world? And one thing that pops up pretty much everywhere is two completely different and complementary attitudes towards the world, two cognitive attitudes towards the world. So we will delve into those uh, quite a lot. As a researcher, I published my, my set of papers. Here are a few. And uh, the papers are typically on, on soundscape. Um, but for example, one paper was on how pleasant sounds promote and annoying sounds impede health, a cognitive approach. So this uh, relates how sounds and health actually go together. Um, another paper uh, is called Learning Autonomy in Two or Three Steps, Linking Open-Ended Development, Authority and Agency to Motivation. And that had to do uh, in general with the question of what is open-ended development? What, what happens if you have a living agent and you let it develop in whatever direction it wants to develop? And we have, of course, examples of humanity, but uh, if you generalize that a bit, uh, then we have life in general that also has an open-ended development that eventually led to the biosphere. Um, another paper is Cognition from Life, the two, uh, more, the two modes of cognition that underlie moral behavior. All life chooses its behavior, and generally uh, it is moral in the sense that Life allows other life to exist, and actually, uh, we go a step further. Life helps other life to exist, and, and that is the reason why the biosphere actually could develop. And that is a, a pretty deep insight that is also very much at the bottom of this paper. Then, uh, another paper, the Nature of Wisdom uh, People's Connection to Nature reflects a deep understanding of life uh, that is about how. Uh, topics like beauty and understanding on connectedness to nature uh, or connectedness to your environment, how they come together. So if um, we look at the different uh, papers, they all contribute something to this uh, class in, in different ways. So for example, this paper uh, focuses on a healthy versus unhealthy environment and adapting mind states to the environment. This is about safety, affordances, complexity. Uh, this is about autonomy, open-ended development, and, and the four motivational states. That is one of those quadrants that, uh, that uh, appear all the time. This is about an active cognition, strategies in response to complexity and affordance content. So this is in st uh, st strategies that life has in uh, response to how complex or how simple the world is and how many opportunities there are. This is two modes of cognition and a link with authoritarianism, uh, with uh, the need for guidance, uh, basically. Um, 
This paper is on two modes of cognition uh, that I use a lot, coping versus co-creation. And uh, like I said, that cognition is actually rooted in the demands of life. This is on adequacy, wisdom, beauty, connected to student nature, and this is a real world application. So my papers, uh, they already connect many of the different aspects uh, that we will be uh, addressing in, in, in this course. So my role in science is a, a bit the role of a theoretician in physics. A theoretician in physics uses mathematical similarities across different sub-disciplines of physics. Um, and I do more or less the same, but not so much focused on mathematics, but more on general patterns or explanatory structures across the disciplines. So things that, have, that different disciplines have discovered and they don't know that other disciplines discovered something pretty similar. Um, and so I focus on the on unifying underlying structures um, and I try to come up with every more generally applicable formulations of those structures across different disciplines. And that leads to more effective summaries of what phenomena actually are or definitions of our phenomena. So I, it, it leads to a generalized soundscape theory. Uh, like I said, the world as perceived or experienced and or understood by an agent or group of agents in context. So that's the key. And I do that basically because I love playing with science and with the deepest and best insights in science. So the approach of this course is uh, to focus on sciences, social sciences, and all kinds of high quality insights that people, high quality thinkers typically have. And I generalize those insights uh, from one domain uh, to see uh, if they provide benefits in another. And so I'll apply an insight in one domain and see, does it actually enhance my understanding of another domain? And in many cases, you can see only the true value of scientific results uh, via a process like that. Um, and that is easy, more easy than you might think, because many domains discovered very similar foundational structures. Uh, so maybe they are rooted in the same uh, basic structure. And what is that basic structure? It is reality. So that uh, focus on foundational common structures lead to uh, a number of oppositions, key dimensions. One of them is two modes of cognition and uh, something that I call nested quadrants, in which you have a quadrant in which you fi can fit another quadrant but 45 degrees uh, turned. And together, those two quadrant structure, or extra structures, they, they help you understand uh, all kinds of different structures that emerge in different fields of science. So what is the scope and what are the topics? Well, that is super broad. Of course, it must be broad because we are looking for unifying uh, structures. But let's uh, go for it. Coping versus co-creation, farming, core effect, energy return of investment, realism, peak mining, money and banking, connectedness to nature, problems and intelligence, the biosphere and wisdom, freedom and dictatorship, life in the biosphere, bureaucracy, the structure of feelings, attitudes towards information, media, taking responsibility, listening, identity development, and the educated mind. That is as broad as it gets, I guess. But these are all real world manifestations on something more foundational. And that is the inner ring, open and closed systems, sustainability, agency, comfort zones, life, self-actualization, and adequacy. And these foundational structures, they are manifestations of something even more central, uh, what I call an active cognition. And that is the approach. So it is not, not a more fundamental thing, it is a way to approach this all. And an active cognition uh, is basically thinking that all cognition arises through and from interactions with the world. And that, together with a number of these core concepts uh, like agency and life, etc., uh, I call core cognition. So core cognition is the cognition necessary uh, by all life to remain alive. So it is the foundational cognition 
shared by all of life. And this then uh, is the key starting point uh, that pervades throughout the whole course. All cognition arises through and from interactions with the world. And we'll see how far that brings us. Well, what can you gain from these lectures? Of course, it is completely up to you. I can't force you to learn anything, and I, I wouldn't even, if I could. Um, so possible gains uh, is that you can become more aware of the systems that you're part of. Um, you can create an outsider perspective of these systems that allows you to judge them more objectively. You can become more aware of the consistent and essential interconnectedness of reality of the world of life in general. You can become more appreciative of the dynamics that shape the world and enhance your life. You can become more aware of your intellectual and epistemological development while you are learning about that and your role in the world. And you become more aware of the basic drivers of the behaviors of yourselves and others. Finally, you can learn to play with the thoughts and insights uh, that, you would norm that would normally be outside uh, your scope or your comfort zone. So you would, you would normally avoid them. And because I, I confront you with them, uh, if you allow that uh, to happen, uh, then you can learn a number of things that you would otherwise not learn or, see, or uh, develop insights that you would otherwise not gain. So, I hope to see you at the session on realism.